Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be together, isn't it? And uh, as Chris has said several times, my name is Peter, if you didn't catch it the first or third time. And uh, I'm one of the leaders here. And we've been looking for a little while now at this great letter of the Apostle Paul to a church in Philippi. So it's the letter to the Philippians. And we're looking at chapter 3, verse 15 to the end of the chapter. Let me ask you a question this morning. It's not an easy one to answer straight off. But the question really is, what is your great ambition in life? What is it that you would most look forward to? The thing, perhaps, that really consumes your thinking and the things that you love the most. I was thinking about that and and thinking of how could I illustrate it, and I was reminded... Um, of the time that my daughter, our daughter, um, was to get married. And for about 18 months before the wedding, her life seemed to be consumed in planning this great event. She had a folder, something that thick. And uh, you can see which family she belongs to. Everything was done carefully, immaculately, systematically, that, that it really would... Uh, be the great day. And um, uh, Linda, my wife, was deeply involved in this, and I rapidly say I was not, um, because she'll only tell you that later on anyway, so I'll confess that. But what I did do, and I did it very carefully and quite regularly, was sign the checks. And uh, the checks seemed to come uh, with increasing rapidity as the year went on, and uh, I, I just kept signing these. In the end, I forgot what I was signing for, really. I just signed them, you know. They gave me a check to sign, and I signed it. Um, So much so that, actually, on the day of the wedding, as my daughter and I were driving into Tenterden, because she was going to be married in St Mildred's, the parish church there, and uh, we were in an open-top car, it was very nice, the bells were ringing. And I said to my daughter, stupidly, oh, the bells are ringing, I wonder why they're ringing. And she said, well, Dad, they're for me. And, of course, I'd paid the check to have the bells ringing, but I honestly could not remember any such thing happening. So the question was, for her, you know, that was the great event. That was the thing that she'd built 18 months of her life up. And I'm only really telling you this. For those of you who have daughters, you better start saving now um, because it's going to come as a massive blow when they want to get married Um, So, that was her ambition, that was what she loved to to look forward to, and the question is, you know, what is it that we look forward to the most? What is true is what our ambition is, what is the thing that occupies our mind that we really, really look forward to, will govern the way we live now. So, what you're hoping for will govern the way you organise your life today. And during this week, and in the coming months, and in the coming years, that is the reality. The question we would ask of the Apostle Paul is, what is it that you're looking forward to? I read a quote uh, just a week or so ago, which speaks of our world that we're in, and I think it is true. This is what Mez McConnell says, there is nothing so cruel in this world as the desolation of having nothing to hope for. And I think we would agree that we know people who seem to lack hope, whose lives have imploded, and there just seems to be just darkness out there. That is the world, and certainly the nation at the moment we live in. But the Apostle Paul, as we have discovered in our Bibles and with this letter of Philippians, is not like that. What is it that is motivating Paul? Well, I put it to you, it is transformation. Your first answer about the Apostle Paul, of course, is that his great ambition was to preach the gospel. That was the thing, wasn't it, that consumed him. I mean, what he had to go through in order to preach the gospel is just truly astonishing. And so we are saying to ourselves, was this the thing that really motivated Paul? Well, of course it was. But I put it to you that what he has hinted at in throughout Philippians is something much greater than that. And if you've been following the songs that Chris chose this week, uh, you'll notice what it is. Do you remember this great verse that was uh, quoted in verse 21 of chapter 1? For to me, says Paul, to live is Christ. 
and to die is gain. That's quite a statement. And you remember uh, last week we looked at the verses, um, verse 13 of chapter 3. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal. What is the goal, Paul? To win the prize for which God has called me heavenwards in Christ Jesus. This is the vision that Paul has for his future. And now, in the passage we had, he sort of brings that together in an extremely clear statement. Verse 20 of chapter 3, But our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so they will be like his glorious body. We eagerly await a saviour from there. Here is the motivation for the Apostle Paul. He is looking forward to the great day when Christ will come again. And we're going to look at that. But of course, Paul doesn't just keep this to himself. He's writing it here in this letter for a reason. And that is so that those he is writing to, these Christians in Philippi, have the same attitude. He wants them to understand that this should also be their greatest love and their greatest ambition. Do you remember how he began this letter? And we spent some time on the first two verses. And it says this, to God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, to God's holy people. And you remember how we expanded on that and said, look, these people were in a a lovely city. It was a well-known city, and it was a Roman city. They were Roman citizens. They had all those privileges. No, no, says Paul, that's not the thing you should be thinking of. You are God's holy people. In Christ Jesus. And our own text this morning says the same thing. Verse 20. Our citizenship, says Paul, is in heaven. You are not citizens really of this earth. You are citizens of heaven. Which is quite a statement. Now, let's face it. For most of us, we are earthbound people. This earth is crying out to us for attention all the time, isn't it? We have so much to do. Um, Linda and I are relatively retired but as I look out on many of you you're very very busy people you still work you have small children there is so much screaming at you every day to get done and it consumes your life some of you are still working and working for your career to expand and to be promoted perhaps And for many of us, you know, we are thinking about how we keep our comforts as we go older and whether we have enough money. And There is so much that is just pouring down upon us, isn't it, every day. And when Paul starts to talk about my citizenship is in heaven, it does seem remote to us, doesn't it? Because heaven is sort of indistinct, isn't it? We don't have a detailed plan of what heaven is is going to look like for God's people. We have hints of it and examples of it and metaphors, but we don't have a photograph. We have no idea what actually, ultimately, heaven will be like. And so it seems remote. But Jim Packer, this great late theologian and preacher and teacher, said this about heaven. It is, in a way, for many Christians, the unknown world, but with its known inhabitant. And its known inhabitant is what Paul is talking about here, isn't it? Our citizenship is in heaven. Well, that sounds okay. No, no. And we eagerly await a saviour from there. The Lord Jesus Christ. Now that is what Paul is looking to. He is looking to the one who is there already. And he is our saviour. And notice how Paul describes it. We eagerly await a saviour from there. The Lord Jesus Christ. Who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control. Just dwell on that for a moment. That our Jesus has everything under his control. Think of the chaos in the world. 
Think of the disturbance in your own life. Think of your own uncertainty about the future. Jesus has it all under control. We may not have. We may not have a clue what's going on. But Jesus does. He has everything under control. But that's not my point, really. He will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. The, the Lord Jesus, with this great power, which is beyond our comprehension, will change everything. My friends, when we think of heaven, do not think for a minute that you and I, if we are Christians and trusting the Lord Jesus, when we go to heaven, we're going to be floating around like smoke or something, like sort of disembodied spirits, you know, in the ether. That's not what it's about. What Paul is hinting at here, and we have it much more clearly in other parts of the Bible, of course, is that there will be a transformation of the world, of this universe that we know. That Jesus in his unlimited power will change everything. And this world that we have grown so accustomed to and that causes us, even as Christians, so many problems, will be consumed by a new heaven and a new earth. And we will not be floating about out there. We will be living upon an, an earth which has been utterly, completely transformed, greater than Eden ever was in the first couple of chapters of Genesis. It will be more wonderful than that. In fact, as I think I've said that one of the great things about eternity, which really challenges us, doesn't it, of what eternity can be like, you know, it, will we get bored? And the answer is no, because there is no time anymore. But what we will do is part of that no time, if you follow me, will be to experience a new heaven and a new earth and to learn it and understand it and to dwell in it. But the point is, we will not be disembodied spirits. This is what Paul says. He will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Now, when I looked at that, it, it stopped me in my tracks, to be honest. Because we consider our Jesus as unique, don't we? And he is. He is God the Son. And he dwells in heaven now with a glorious body. In what way will our bodies be like his? Well, one thing that is true is that our bodies, thankfully for many of us, will be transformed. Body image is a big thing these days, isn't it? People are earning millions out of getting you to have this body image, the perfect body, which none of us seem to have. But we want it. Well, on that day, your body will be perfect. And it will be a body that seems to me that we will recognize each other. That's a wonderful thing. We will know, just as Mary saw Jesus and the disciples saw the resurrected Jesus, they knew who he was. And we will know each of us. We will recognize each other. But this new body won't just be that we will be free of all the constraints of this body and all its weakness, which we're all feeling. I was reminded of that of my own body this week, but I won't go into that. But I was reminded that my body also is falling apart and I'm getting older and you can see that, but please don't say a word. And the thing is that I just live with that and you will live with it too. Even the younger ones who think that it's never going to happen to you, you will get older and bits will begin to fall off. And that's the reality. Now, when we reach heaven, we will have this new body, which will not be like that. It will not grow old. It will be a perfect body. At last, we will be perfect, free from sin and illness and um, heartache and misery and mourning and, and loss. All of that will be not even a memory anymore as we stand in the glory. But it seems to me that we're not just as it were, with perfect bodies. But there is something glorious about that body. It will be glorious. As Jesus is glorious in heaven and we long to see him, so the body that we will have in heaven, says Paul, will be glorious. It will be like his glorious body. There will be some glory about it. And I think also the other thing that we will have will be bodies uh, which have powers that we know nothing about. 
We will have abilities and powers that we know nothing of on this earth. And that will be part of the glory and of eternity and of seeing Jesus. And that transformation of Christ will be what we look forward to. So this is what Paul is saying. This is my motivation for my life. This is my ambition that I will be there with this Savior who will transform this lowly body and make it into a body like his. John the Apostle actually puts it so clearly for us this morning. Dear friends, now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. Well, that's true, isn't it? But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The transforming power of the vision of Christ will change everything for us. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. You see... Having that ambition changes our lives now. It has a daily effect upon us, how we live, because of our view of our Saviour and all that he will do when we reach our heavenly home. This world is not the home of the Christian. Heaven is. The presence of Christ is. That's where our citizenship is. But let's press on. That, in a way, is the positive, isn't it? Transformation. That's what every Christian should be looking for. But there's another word in here, and it is the word destruction. Now, emotion is not something, if we are British, and maybe some of those who are here who are not British, maybe it's different for you, we don't show our emotions very well, do we, as men? It, it, I think things have changed, but generally, we don't like to show our emotions. If I stood here and burst into tears, I suspect you would be embarrassed. It's just not something a man does, and certainly not does in public. We would find that difficult. It's interesting how Paul, the, this great apostle, was so different than us. Verse 18 of our passage, For as I have often told you before, And now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. Now, when we read that, we have to ask ourselves, who is Paul talking about? He's picked this up without actually explaining who they are. He just tells us about them. And there are those commentators who think he's talking actually about, do you remember the Judaizers? Do you remember that, the Judaizers? Those who in the beginning of chapter 3, you can glance at it if you need to be reminded, who were Jewish Christians and were saying to Gentile Christians, people like us, you've got to become Jewish to be really saved. It's no good you just trusting in the Lord Jesus. That's lovely and that's fine. But you've got to be also Jewish. You've got to take on the Jewish uh, religion and all of that that means. Now, some commentators think that's what Paul is talking about here. And they extrapolate from that every phrase he makes here as being very Jewish. Jewish oriented. Personally, I don't think it needs to have that restriction. I think Paul is talking about here people that you and I maybe know as well who have once trusted in Christ, it would seem. Who have said that they are Christians and seem to have lived as Christians and have been part of the church. But what has happened is that they've now turned their back on Christ. They've now stopped saying they believe in Jesus. They've gone back into the world. That's what it says here. Their mind is set on earthly things. That is what has happened. And the world has drawn them like a magnet back into its fold, into its embrace. And now these once seeming to be Christians are just living now just like the pagans. That's what it says, isn't it? Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. It's a rather strange phrase, isn't it? It just means they've taken on the world. They've taken on its sensuality, its sexual sin, 
that's taken on um, it, just the, the, the pleasures of pagan society. That's what it has done. Another quote that I, I read this week was helpful, and it's this. Worldliness, a description of worldliness, where righteousness is strange and sin is normal. And that describes the society that these people have gone back into. But of course, <laughs> it describes our society pretty well as well, doesn't it? Righteousness is odd. And sin is just normal. And if you argue against it, well, you're really abnormal. And this is the world that these people have gone back to. Their destiny their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. They've just gone back and stepped back thoroughly into the world. And in fact, not only that, they live as enemies of Christ. These people who once seemed to agree to the gospel of Jesus Christ and seem to adhere to the cross of Christ and his gift of salvation, they're now enemies of it. They actually talk against it. And some of them may even preach against it. Well, you don't have to go a million miles to see her in own day, exactly the same thing happening. There are those that I know who I thought of as being clear Christians who had a public attention to their preaching and now deny the whole thing, deny everything, and have gone this way, this loving of the world, these earthly things. But why is Paul in tears? Well, not only because of the loss to the church that these poor people have just stepped out and gone back into the world. That is, that is sad. But that's not what Paul is in tears over. What is he in tears over? He is in tears because destruction is on its way. Do you get that? He is unequivocal. Their destiny is destruction. This world, as we leave it, for those without Christ, who are not following Christ and giving their lives to Christ, there is judgment. There will be the judgment throne of God. And that, there will be no escape for those who are not covered by the Lord Jesus and his righteousness and his blood. And therefore there is destruction. That's the word that Paul uses. It is hell. In other words, my friends, we have to live to gain heaven through Christ and do all we can to stay away from a hell which is heading the way of all unbelievers. How do we do that? Here's the practical question. How do we make sure that our assurance in Christ is real? How do we make sure that our faith in Christ is a genuine thing? Well, Paul tells us that, and he tells us at the beginning. You've noticed I've worked in reverse this morning to the text. And the text begins like this. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. If on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, just, and just as you have us, us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Paul is talking about maturity. He's talking about progress. Now, I suspect, as I look out on you this morning, all of us consider ourselves mature. We are mature people. The odd thing about us as human beings is we can be incredibly immature sometimes, can't we, in the way we behave? Ask Linda. And, uh, you know, it's just the way we are. Uh, we can just sometimes slip back into childish behavior. And Paul is saying, look, you and I need to progress in the faith. We do not stay still. This is what we were looking at last week. And that's the words he's using, isn't he? Do you remember how he talks about pressing on? Do you remember that? He uses that phrase twice in the previous verses. To press on in the faith. To go on seeking Christ. To learning about Christ. And how are we to press on? And this I found really an interest. Verse 17. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have, have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. In other words... Look at the apostles, 
look at those who are following the apostles in the way they live and copy them. That's how you should live. I find that extraordinary. I'm not sure you would be quite willing to write that to someone else, but Paul is. You see, he's not being self-righteous. He's already said in those previous verses that I'm not perfect, I'm pressing on. He's not perfect. But what Paul is doing is saying, look at the apostles, look at me, I'm following in the footsteps of Christ and you must follow the way I live because that is the way to be mature. You know, it occurs to me that one of the reasons Paul says to follow him and to copy him is that when Paul is writing, the New Testament is not yet complete. There are letters and other parts of the gospel circulating. Perhaps John's gospel hasn't been written yet. So this New Testament is not yet complete. And so when he is teaching about Jesus, they need concrete examples to remember. And so they look at him and they see the concrete example of what he's teaching. I teach Jesus like this. I follow Jesus like this. You follow me. And interestingly, you and I are not immune from this because we are being called also to be examples of the Lord Jesus, are we not? And as we come together as church, that is a place where we see an example of those who are following Jesus. And people look at us. You, unfortunately, have to look at me this morning, but I'm looking at you as well. And as we circulate and work together as a church, then we are being examples, are we not, to one another. Good examples or bad examples. And the reality is, whatever it's like in church, whether you've ever thought of it like this, be sure that out in the world where you step tomorrow, you will meet people who can't believe a word you say about Christianity. And they don't actually know what you're talking about either. But what they will do is read you like a book. That's what they'll do. They will see your life. And doesn't matter what you say, that life has to demonstrate Jesus if it's going to have any credibility with people who don't believe in him this morning. So Paul is not a million miles from us, but notice how he explains things. He says, um, all of us then who are mature should take such a view of things, everything he said up to this point. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Because interestingly, we have our New Testament. We have no excuse. We have our whole Bible. And there we can not only see men and women of God and how they live their lives in faith and in trust and with a view of heaven itself, but we see our Lord Jesus so graphically displayed in the Gospels and talked about and taught about in the letters. And so we have no excuse. And so as we read our scriptures and as you hear preaching and teaching and as you gather in home group what are you doing you are asking the Lord to make things clear to you and to me that he goes on teaching his church and we've not all arrived yet some of us are still growing in maturity some of us consider ourselves mature but Paul says press he says only let us live up to what we have attained what you know today live up to it and then God will teach you more. And then you live up to that. Do you see how it works? That's maturity. That's how you press on. My friends, you know, this point of heaven and realizing this earth for all its beauty and all the pleasure we get from it is not actually our home is an important concept for us. How do you think brother and sister Christians across the world who today are facing intense persecution, our Christian brothers and sisters, and there are some in Afghanistan, who now consider their lives hanging by a thread. How do you think they can cope with that sort of persecution? How do you think they can actually go to death or to imprisonment or to the loss of family or to the loss of their jobs and become paupers, 
How can that happen? Because they are convinced they have a heart which tells them every day, this world is not my home. I am citizens of a much greater home than this. And that home is on its way, and that is eternal. What is now is just ephemeral. It is passing away. But my home in heaven with Christ is permanent and sure. That's how they cope. And that's how we cope. We may not be under intense persecution. And we're not. Not even a glimmer of it, really, compared with some people across the world. But your world turns upside down, does it not? You have your disappointments, you have your illness, you have your bereavement and loss. You and I suffer. Sometimes, quite frankly, if I can put it colloquially, our life sucks. It's as simple as that. How do we hang in there? How do we go on rejoicing? Remember, this letter is a letter of rejoicing. Joy, joy, joy. It gets very irritating when you don't feel very joyful to be told to rejoice. How do we cope? Because we know that we are not citizens first and foremost of this world, but of the world to come. Where our Jesus, who has all power, will transform us to be somehow like him. Let us be those Christians, as hard as it is with all the world about us, and it often seems so strange to those who know us, be those people who are convinced, as Paul was, our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a saviour from there. Notice the word eager. We eagerly await a saviour from there. The Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so they will be like his glorious body.